<clears throat> All right. So uh, last time we had talked about how the behavior of resistors uh, with alternating current. We looked at the behavior of capacitors with alternating current. And then we wrapped up that discussion by putting the two together and seeing the nature of what we call a RC circuit. And one of the uses for that is it uh, the resistor and capacitor have different responses depending on the frequency of oscillation. And so as a result of that, it can act as a filter. And uh, that's what we left off with. Now, <clears throat> what we want to do for the remainder of the stuff here is to throw in the inductor, see how that behaves, and then start mixing and matching stuff and see what kind of fun things we can create out of it. So in this example here, we see our basic inductor AC circuit. We have the EMF alternating source there. We have our inductor. Now, inductors are pretty fond of AC stuff, as you might imagine, because they respond to changes, and AC is all about changes. So the inductor is very excited to be part of the big party we have with our AC stuff. So um, <clears throat> now, due to loop law, right, the... Um, the voltage instantaneously across the power source will match what it is for the inductor. Obviously, they're flipped. Um, so the EMS, so the voltage across the inductor is pretty straightforward. And we will use this to investigate how the current's going to go. Now, the relationship between voltage and current for the inductor is the equation that you see right here. Um, the voltage is the inductance times uh, di dt. These are instantaneous values. Um, we didn't, I don't have a negative sign here. I'm not sure why I didn't include the negative sign here. I'm trying to think for a minute here. Why is that not in here? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, just remember the fact that, you know, if current is decreasing, that's a potential gain. If current is increasing, then that's a um, that's going to be a potential uh, negative difference. So um, I'm not sure why I didn't include the negative sign. I guess it's just kind of inherently built into DIDT. I mean, it is. So that's strange, though. What was I thinking here? I don't know what I was thinking. Um, potential decreases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't. Hmm. Maybe it'll come to me later. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's very strange I didn't do that. Anyway, so if we want to figure out what the current is, as you can see from this equation here, we're going to have to separate differentials. Don't tell them how Professor I did that. And then integrate both sides of the equation to get an expression for I. Now, we're going to be integrating that cosine function, so we're going to get a sine out of it. So, um we are going to separate the differentials, like I mentioned here, uh, write out what the voltage is, uh, inductor. That's our cosine there. Uh, the v, uh, capital VL, it's the peak voltage across the inductor comes out. Inductance is on the bottom here. Those are constants, right? So we integrate our cosine function and we get a sine out of that. Uh, we'll get a factor of omega in the bottom here from the integration. And the thing is, is we want to take this sine and we want to put it back in terms of our cosine because we are thinking about phasers, right? And we want all of our values to be of the same trig function uh, with just a different phase constant. So it's sort of easier to see what's going on there. Uh, the peak current is given by VL over omega L. This omega L might look like something familiar. We're going to have a similar reactance equation here. But here's how the graphs are going to look for this. Now, having your current be at this cosine here, the negative pi over 2 here, uh, means that the current's going to lag in this case. Voltage peaks first, 
than the current. So we say here that the current lags the voltage by 90%. Okay, so here's your standard sine function here, the cosine function, and the difference between them. I mean, I'm, the actual heights of these are not really important because they have different units anyway, but it's, it's, it's the phase difference between these that are important. Okay, so... And this sort of makes sense if you think about this. I mean, just in terms of how inductors behave, the max amount of voltage is when the current is changing uh, the most. So that's that slope here on the, uh, on the graphs, right? The most dramatic change, right? DI, DT, that's what V is related to. And so that's the, that's the biggest change in the current. So the voltage peaks when the current is going through the greatest amount of change. Then as the current is driving through, the voltage drops. And then when the current gets to that peak, at that point, the voltage is a zero. But then everything starts to go the other direction. So the current starts to pick up as the voltage starts to grow. And, I mean, sorry, the, the current drops. All right, so that makes sense in terms of what we know an inductor does. Right? It responds to changes. So the current's going to lag, right, because it's responding to the change. Okay. So here's how the phasers are going to look. Um, the voltage phaser, which this is what the inductors experience, and also obviously what the EMF is of the power source, and the current phaser lags. So we put a 90 degree angle here, and as this thing rotates, the voltage hits first, and then the current hits second. Fantastic. All right, now, um, that equation back here, this peak, the peak current here, is a function of the frequency, just like it was when we did capacitor stuff. Uh, this occurs in the bottom here. So we want to write this like it, so it looks like an Ohm's law. And if we do that, then uh, we simply can say that omega L is our XL, or XL is what we call the inductive reactance. And what this is telling us is that when we alter our frequency, Right? We're going to be changing what the effective resistance is of the inductor. And this right here is a linear relationship. So what happens is as the frequency gets higher, the inductive reactance gets higher, and therefore the peak current is lower. High frequencies don't produce a very strong current here. Okay. If things are changing very rapidly, there really isn't any time to see much of a change. I mean, you can imagine, right, you have to respond to changes. And if the changes happen very rapidly, you can't produce much of a response. So if the current is very high, sorry, if the uh, frequency is very high, the inductance is high, therefore the current, peak current, right, is going to be rather low. Okay. So let's look at some examples here. So I guess I just have this out like that, weird. Okay, uh, we have a 25 micro Henry inductor uh, used in a circuit that oscillates at 100 kilohertz. That would be F, by the way. Okay, they don't say angular frequency and they give you an oscillation frequency, it's F. Uh, the, and also you can also see by the units too. I mean, it's you don't really wanna say angular frequencies and hertz, I mean, you could, it's weird. The current through the inductor reaches a peak value of 20 milliamps at five microseconds, excellent. What is the peak? Okay, blah, 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 great. Okay, so what we're we looking for here, peak inductor voltage, okay. And one closest to five microseconds does it occur. Okay, let's look at it. All right, so we wanna work out what our inductive reactance is. That's gonna be an important part of this problem, obviously, because you can't get that peak without that value. So two pi times the frequency, so that'd be one times 10 to the fifth. And the value for L is 25 times 10 to the sixth because it's micro Henry's. And we get out of this a 16 ohm inductive reactance. And we can immediately apply that to the Ohm's law equivalent expression we had. The peak current is 20 milliamps uh, times that 16 ohms, we get uh, 320 millivolts as the peak voltage. Now, what's the other part of the question here? It is when closest to five microseconds does it occur? Okay, so the current through the inductor reaches a peak value at 
five microseconds. When is the inductor voltage? Well, it's going to occur before, right? Because our current's lagging here. So the voltage peaks, then we get our current peak. And now we just really got to figure out what the period is for this. Um, if you take that 100 kilohertz, right? You just got to flip that. So 100 kilohertz is 10 microseconds. So that tells us where we are in this thing. And you cut that by a fourth, which is 2.5, because we're off by a 90 degree phase, right? So that's, that's a quarter of the period. So this happened, the current peaks, uh, the, sorry, the voltage peaks first, then the current peaks, and it would be different by a quarter of the period. A quarter of the period is 2.5, so we take our five microseconds, subtract the 2.5 off of that, and we get at 2.5 microseconds is when this occurred. So, let's see here. All right, so uh, at t equals zero, we apparently did not have a peak voltage. So this is, this is one thing that's going to be tricky about this problem is you look at this five and you sort of assume, oh, that's, you know, that, you know that's when thing, you know, things start at t equals zero for the peak voltage. And then your current peaks. Well, it turns out it's not the case. So you really have to be aware of what your period is and then place events inappropriately. Don't make the assumption that t equals zero is when things start. Um, a standard cycle, as we've introduced it, apparently starts at 2.5 microseconds. So, okay. All right. Any questions about this one? Anything unclear about this? Okay. Another example here, find the value of the EMF frequency and inductance from the graph. Ooh, that's cool. Uh, we have to look at peaks, all right? The peak value is what we're interested in here. So let me jump over to my written out example. This is pretty straightforward. All right, find the EMF, find the value of the EMF frequency. So, oh, I guess I did it a different way than I thought I was going to do. Hmm. Oh, we don't have... We have the peak current. We have the peak voltage. Oh, we don't have the inductance, though. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay, so based on, you'll see in the trig functions here, we can see that a cycle lasts, what, 20 milliseconds? So 20 milliseconds, you flip that, you get 50 hertz out of that. Um, now we want to figure out what the inductance is. That's the value of L. We have our peak voltage is 1. Our peak current is 2. That's nice. Um, we want to write out what the inductance is in terms of omega L, and we've got to solve for L. So the peak is 1 for volts, 2 for the current. Mm -hmm. 2 pi 50 is our uh, uh, value for omega, and we get 1.6 milli henries. Have a big party, okay, with our resistor and inductor and uh, capacitors here. Now, you can't tell in the image, but each of these elements, the R the L and the C are six feet apart and they're wearing masks. So everything is completely fine here. We should be good in doing this kind of problem. Um, we set them all up in series. We call it the series um, RLC. I like LRC better. LRC, it sounds like that burrito. I don't think they have that burrito anymore, whatever, okay. Uh, the L series RLC circuit has all three of them. Uh, in a series. Um, of course, the currents are have to be the same throughout, instantaneous values, not peak. And <clears throat> of course, according to loop law, all these voltages have that up, instantaneous values. So remember, these things are all out of phase with each other, right? Inductors lag, capacitors lead. And so we're gonna have a, a slightly more complicated look to the behavior of this circuit here. This is gonna be fun. You're gonna see this, check this out. Okay, let's let's go through how we would do this. <clears throat> We're gonna draw out our current. Because the current is something that's gonna be very um, standard to visualize on the phasor diagram um, because that is that instantaneous value of current is the same for all of them. Okay, the voltage may peak differently though, so. All right, we'll just draw this in some arbitrary angle. It really doesn't matter. But the length is 
And it really doesn't matter what how you initially draw it. I mean, you might want to draw it just on the x-axis just because it's just consistent. But it really doesn't matter how you do that. And then we draw out our um, phasers for the peak voltages of the three elements. Now, what you want to do here, though, is the resistor is going to be in phase with the current. We know that the um, current lags the inductor voltage, and we know that the current leads in the capacitor voltage. So you want to draw them out in their correct orientations, and the length of the vectors do matter here. Um, they actually matter quite a bit. You want to be mindful of when you draw these out that they're the correct lengths relative to each other. Scout, be quiet. I'm teaching. All right, so like, for example here, we're going to have to combine all three of these vectors, right, to get what the uh, EMF source, uh, how that's going to peak. And you can see here that if the inductor peak voltage is big enough, we're going to end up with a, a current that is uh, going to, uh, uh, that's going to lag overall. Because if you combine, like, so look at here, if we subtract VL and VC, the residual is going to be a long VL. And then you combine VL and VR, and you got something up in this quadrant up here is where the resultant is going to be. And so that means the EMF will peak first for, that, for the power source, and then the current does. So um, these lengths matter quite a bit because it's going to completely change the behavior of the circuit. So, all right, so... Scout, go downstairs. Don't. Scout, close the door. Sorry. All right, so we're going to subtract VL and VC. That's what this phaser is here. It's the difference between the two. And we are going to combine uh, the VR and, the, and the, uh, the difference between the inductor and the capacitor one. Again, this is going to be Pythagorean theorem here. We're adding up these as your you know, as their vectors. So, and then the angle that is given um, between the x-axis and wherever that e naught vector is uh, will be what our phase angle is. So we have this relationship down here that relates all these peak quantities together. This is just a Pythagorean theorem thing we do here. So instantaneous values add, but the peak values have to obey this relationship right here. Now, Again, depending on what the values of V, L, and V, C are, uh, we could end up with, um, you know, a positive quantity for that vector. So it would look like this, where it's, it, it, it's, it points up and left here, just based on how we drew it. Or if V, C is significantly large, then this picture is basically flipped. This vector now go goes down and right, and e naught is going to be somewhere down here. So we have this kind of arbitrary phase angle here. It's going to be a function of exactly how long things are. Um, you obviously, you can get that phase angle pretty easily by, you know, like an inverse tangent or something. Um, but if it's, you know, if VL minus VC is negative, then obviously that's a negative angle when you do your inverse tangent. Okay, so let's going to put everything in there. Um, now we're going to use the Ohm's Law equivalent statement here. We're going to put in what the currents are. So for VR, we're going to put in RI. And then for the peak voltage uh, for the inductor and the capacitor, we're going to put in the values for the inductive reactants into there. And then finally at the bottom, we're going to solve for I. And we're going to write this in terms of the frequency. So we have this pretty big expression here that represents what the peak current is going to be given the values of all the elements involved and the frequency of the emf source and that will dictate exactly for us what this peak is now what's interesting about this function down here it's a kind of complicated function right it's one over radical constant plus your variable minus one over your variable that quantity is squared that's not a simple function 
Um, and I'll show you that in a moment here. In fact, I'll go back to the phase, but this is what the function looks like. Um, it's a complicated function, but it has a peak at a particular location. And that's the biggest response you get out of the circuit. So if you go back here and look, oh, you didn't see that stuff. If you look at this function down here, um, you know, you're, it's r squared plus this quantity squared, right? So if this quantity has any value at all, that makes the denominator bigger and the current smaller. So the way that you would get the most current out of this is this term has to be zero. So what you do is you set it equal to zero and solve for omega to figure out what value gives you that peak there. And so solving for omega is uh, one over radical LC, and we call this the resonant frequency. This is the frequency that if selected, will make the denominator as small as possible and will produce the highest uh, peak in, uh, well, it will produce the largest current value for the setup that we have. Uh, in fact, when you read the textbook, this thing at the bottom here, this whole radical, um, they actually refer to it by a name that I did not put in here, so I'll put that in right now. This is what's called the impedance. It's usually given by Z. Z is called the impedance. Impedance. Impedance, I think it's with an A. And that's what this thing is down here, this value. This whole radical down here is labeled, it's usually labeled Z. As and, and it's called an impedance. Did I spell that right? I think I did. M. Impede ants. Got it. All right. That works. Impedance. All right. So um, now the phase angle, as I mentioned, uh, can be determined by doing an uh, inverse tangent. So this. You know, basically the value of this angle here is, is sort of telling you how the current behaves relative to the EMF voltage, uh, the power source voltage. Um, you know, if this is a positive value, then your your voltage peaks first than the current. Um, and then if it's negative, the opposite's true. So, all right. Um, no, so, okay, wh what, is, what good is this thing, huh? Well, I'll tell you what, how good is this. Um, you can, this, having this setup, you can alter your values of L and C inside your circuit to adjust to whatever frequency you want to have a maximum response at. That's a type of selector. I mean, what we are looking at here is a basic idea of a tuner. If you want a particular frequency to be selected to get the most signal out of that, then we adjust our capacitor inductors. Remember, they're geometrical, so you can do that mechanically. Adjust them and, and, and select a frequency you want. If there's a radio station broadcasting at a particular frequency, when you change your tuners, now this is old, older kind of radios would, would do this. The, the tuners today are a lot more complicated than what they can do, but... The basic idea is if you want to pick up a particular signal from somewhere, you adjust your radio, which is really just adjusting the capacitor and the inductor in there, and you're selecting a particular frequency that you want that signal to get through and the other frequencies are out. You notice, though, that this is a peak and it has wings on it. So, you know, what can happen is some signals are, are more broadband than they need to be, and when you select a particular frequency, if there's another signal that's still very powerful enough, it can overlap. And you tend to hear like two things on the same radio station, sort of. I'm simplifying things a lot when I say that, but um, that is the general idea. So um, this is one of the interesting things we can do with series RLC circuits is they can act as a selector, a tuner basically. So, Okay, if the value of R is increased, the resonant frequency of this circuit does what? What happens to so the resonant frequency if we up the resistance? C. C is good. Cross the uh, crossover frequency, the resonant frequency, not crossover, resonant frequency uh, does not depend on R. It's 1 over radical L times C. Good, good, good. Uh, this one, however, though, uh, the resonant frequency of this circuit is 1,000 hertz. To change the resonant frequency to 
2,000 hertz. We're going to replace a capacitor. What we're going to do? What's that capacitor got to be? A. Yep, that's it. And so remember, how do you do that on a capacitor, right? The geometric, if it's a parallel plate capacitor, is epsilon, what, A times A over D, or is it? Capacitor is, so what, epsilon, the A over D, I believe. A over D, right? A over D? Yeah, A over D. So if you want to up the capacitance, you could reduce the distance between the plates by a factor of four. That would up the capacitance to by a factor of four. Yeah, so great. All right, so what's going on in the resonance though? So what happens is if we are um, at a lower resonant frequency, okay, lower resonant frequency, um, And for a lower resident frequency, uh, you're going to have the situation where that difference is negative. And, uh, you know, comparing um, the inductive reactants and the uh, capacitive reactants, that would result in a negative value for that. And so the phase angle is negative, and then the current is going to lead the MF. It will peak first. Then that peak, then the voltage peaks later. Uh, the opposite is true if you have your positive phase angle there. The inductor plays a greater role, and then the current will lag. And of course, at resonance, uh, they all pe they peak together. So, all right, let's do this example here. We're a little short today because it is is sort of the last lecture in a way. Um, it's not, but. But this is this is the end of AC stuff. So this is less, there isn't much more to do after this. So I, I I'd apologize, but I don't think anybody really minds that we're gonna be done early. All right. So a series RLC circuit consists of we got the resistor, the inductor, and the capacitor. It is connected to an oscillator with a peak voltage of five. Great. Determine the impedance. Okay, the impedance is at Z. So that's radical R squared plus XL minus XC quantity squared. Um, now where I have to put in um, what the values for those things are. So omega L and one over omega C. We have our um, frequency at um, 3000 kilohertz. The problem here says three and four, but if you do it for three, four is just different numbers. So it's not interesting to do that. But uh, we've got to put in what omega is. So omega is going to be 2 pi times 3,000. That all goes in here. It's a big monster equation here. But what you get out of that is 70. Um, 70 uh, ohms for that, actually. And you can see we're not at we're not at resonance, actually. Because at residence, your uh, impedance is just equal to R. So 50 is what that... The, basically the smallest value that the opinion is going to have here. We're at 70 though. And um, the peak current is given by the EMF peak over the impedance, so 72 milliamps. And our phase angle is negative. Uh, so that means the capacitor is playing a bigger role here. And uh, if the capacitor is playing a bigger role, let's go back to that figure. And so you have this situation here. The capacitor plays a bigger role. And so the current here is leading. It peaks first, the voltage then peaks in the second. 